joint work uh, I uh, the other day I also very poor um, uh, I've been working now for a couple of years on a circle of a circle of ideas um, that are all related to the physics of n equals two supersymmetric gauge theory and most of them have in some way something to do with um, uh, the problem of VPS wall crossing in uh, in n equals two theories. Um, so, so I'm going to sort of review most. I'm going to review some parts of what we did over the, over the last couple of years, and then Greg is going to describe some some new results. Um, and David, I think, will also talk about some things that are in some way uh, at least distantly related um, to what we did. Um, the reason why stuff about n equals two. Uh, uh, gauge theory at any place in a conference on quantum Leibniz theory um, will also become. Well, let's say this. As we all know, this there's recently been discovered some strong correspondences between uh, um, certain n equals two theories, um, uh, certain n equals two theories and Leibniz theory at its higher sort of total generalizations. Uh, and about that, you'll see just a few glimmers of it uh, in my talk and in Greg's talk. And then probably the other day we'll say a little, uh, a little bit more about it. Um, so for the moment, so for the moment, I'm just going to talk about uh, uh, n equals two theories. Um, and particularly in the first part of the talk, I'm not going to assume that there are the n equals two theories that have anything to do with Leibniz uh, necessarily. I'm just going to start with an arbitrary n equals two supersymmetry against theory in four dimensions. Um, so an n equals two theory in four dimensions uh, on its Coulomb branch. Um, but since not everyone here spends a lot of time thinking about uh, n equals two theories, um, and what I'm going to describe ultimately can be phrased in a purely mathematical way, I want to give sort of a uh, sort of an axiomatic construction or presentation of what's the data that we really need coming from an n equals two theory uh, uh, in four dimensions. Um, so what is the data? Well, first of all, if you have uh, an n equals two h theory in four dimensions, it has a Coulomb branch. So the Coulomb branch. Um, so I'll call the Coulomb branch B with some complex manifold. So this is the Coulomb branch. Um, and for most of what I say, uh, you may as well think, you may as well imagine for having a mental picture, you may as well imagine that B is really just one dimensional. Um, so it's really the U plane that people talk about in the context of uh, cyber witten theory. Um, and then inside of this inside of this complex manifold. So I'll call a generic point. Well, a generic point to, of the Coulomb branch. I'll call uh, U. And then inside of here, there are some some special points. Uh, so at a generic point, uh, at a generic point uh, of the Coulomb branch, the infrared physics is really just described by um, the deep infrared physics is really just described by a pure abelian uh, uh, abelian n equals two gauge theory. Um, but there are, importantly, there are some special points. Uh, there are some special points where that description breaks down, where there are some extra massless fields, and the, and the infrared is, is more complicated. So, so there are some singular points. So let's say there's a singular divisor d inside of b, um, and and so away from the singular divisor, there's a smooth locus. So let's say on the smooth locus. B prime is just a complement of uh, complement. Uh, okay, so that's so that's uh, that's the first thing you get for, for an n equals two theory. Um, the second thing you get is so at every point, so if I sit at some random point here, I have an abelian gauge theory, um, and that abelian gauge theory it's a quantum abelian gauge theory, so it has a lattice of electric and magnetic charges. So gamma lattice of electric and magnetic charges. Well, in fact, uh, in fact, the theory has potentially has more than just the gauge charges. Um, it can have electric and magnetic charges, but it can also have some flavor charges. So let's just say gamma is the lattice of charges. Um, well, so gamma is made up of the flavor charges uh, and the gauge charges. So we write it as an extension. Uh, 
Um, so gamma g, this gamma g here is really the lattice of uh, electric and electric and magnetic charges in the theory. Um, this gamma is the total lattice, and uh, gamma f is the um, is the lattice of flavor charges. Um, now there's a few more things to say about this. So I guess the first thing to say is that um, there's a natural pairing. So this gamma g, um, being the lattice of gauge charges, comes with this natural pairing, um, anti-symmetric pairing. Anti-symmetric in integer, integer pairing, which is sometimes called the DSD pairing. Um, anti-symmetric. Um, and then just through this map, you can also think of that as a pairing on uh, gamma. So it's just uh, it's trivial on the flavor on the flavor charges. Um, the other thing to say is that I just I said this is a lattice, but that's a little crude. It's actually uh, um, it's not it's not a global lattice, but rather it's a local system of lattices. Um, so as you move around in the Coulomb branch, this is one of the most important things that the uh, Siberian would. Cyberian so wouldn't point it out. As you move around in the Coulomb branch, there can be monochroming. So if you have, for example, an electron here, and you go around it, it may come back as an electron plus a monopole or something. Um, uh, so this is really, so this is really more carefully a local system of lattices. Well, that's right. That's right. Very good. Uh, that's right. And this is only over V prime. So it doesn't have an extension over here. So it monogram is around this uh, single line. Um, so this gamma is a local system, but actually gamma f is not. So the gamma f part of it is global. Um, uh, so the monogram is uh, um, well, yeah, the gamma f part. Uh, the gamma f part is globally trivial. Um, okay. So then, so so far I just told you some sort of crude. Uh, some sort of crude information. It's not enough to give you the low energy Lagrangian as it stands. Um, in order to give you the low energy Lagrangian, uh, basically I mean, you just have to have one more thing. Um, and the one more thing that you need is homomorphism. Uh, so these are the so called central charges. So just to every charge, you attach a, uh, uh, to every charge, Every gamma and gamma, we attach z gamma, uh, which is a function, um, which is a function on v prime, uh, uh, which is a holomorphic function. So I'm saying we 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 give. At every point, we give a homomorphism from the charge lattice into C, uh, and then that homomorphism uh, has to vary homomorphically as you uh, as you move around in the Coulomb branch. So to every charge, you attach a you attach a homomorphic function, and then because this lattice is monochromy, these functions also have monochromy. So you can have, for example, if the mon monochromy around one of these points, you often find that these functions are like logs. Um, okay, um, and uh, so some description. Uh, okay, so so with just the data I told you so far, um, I couldn't say what the monogramy is. Now, if you also know the degeneracies of BPS states, uh, which we'll get to in a minute, then you can describe what the monogramy is. The monogramy really comes from some BPS state that becomes massless at that point. Um, and it is sort of like Picard Lechette's. In the simplest case, it looks exactly like Picard Lechette's. In general, it's some small generalization. Well, around, sorry, around the code, yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Um, so okay, so 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 all of these are the data. If you have all these data, then you can completely describe um, what the theory looks like in the infrared at certain different points of the program. Um, and then, so the object, the object of, of, of our interest that got us started to thinking about these things um, was one extra piece of data. Um, and the extra piece of data is the degeneracies of BPS states. 
So the degeneracies of GPS states uh, are captured by, um, again, just a, just a uh, function on the charge lattice. This time an integer value function. Um, so for every charge, um, for every charge gamma, um, for every charge gamma and every point on the Coulomb branch, you can ask uh, how many states are there, in, how many uh, BPS states are there in the spectrum um, with the charge gamma. Integers, uh, or maybe gamma, uh, also depend on point uh, U of the Coulomb branch. Um, so let's see. I don't think I want to write. Um, well, for those who know about any of those two theories, this is the second velocity uh, supertrace. I don't want to write the definition. I just want to say it's some integer that counts the number of states of the charge gamma. Um, and it's a, it's not just a counting them, but it's a kind of index that counts them with signs. Uh, and so there's sort of standard supersymmetry arguments that, that tell you that this number uh, ought to be uh, invariant under all the deformations, all the all the uh, uh, deformations of the theory in particular. Um, it's supposed to be invariant if you move around on the Coulomb branch. So sort of formally, formally you would think that these uh, um, these integers would just be constant as you as you vary. Um, and the truth of the matter is that that's not quite true. Um, so, so naively, a constant as function of u actually they have these wall, this wall crossing to here. Um, so the real picture is that um, you have b, and then inside of b you have these loci, um, these loci where um, the integer invariants uh, recounting the GPS states uh, can jump. Um, so then you have the question, uh, okay, well they're not invariants, but um, if I can describe exactly how it jumps, it's almost as good as uh, having an invariant. So you ask the question, um, uh, how do these things jump when you move from one side of the wall to the other? Uh, well, that's the question that uh, that's the question that. Well, there's been a lot of work uh, done on that question. Um, is there are some nice formula in generality for general gauge theory. Where is this wall stop? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, the walls are just at the, at the low side where the central charges can line up. So. Right, so if I call this wall, say, uh, W gamma, W gamma, the locus where omega gamma can jump, I'll tell you where it is. So W gamma is just the locus where, is just the locus of U, where there exists gamma 1 and gamma 2, linearly independent, um, where gamma 1 plus gamma 2 equals gamma, and Z of gamma 1 and U over z of gamma 2 of u is a real positive number. Um, so, uh, does, does that good with the potential know about Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so if, you have, if you have all the data that I gave up till here, so in fact, I didn't even say the word pre-potential, but uh, um, from the pre-potential you extract these z's. Um, and the z's are really what you need. Uh, um, uh, so, so, so that's right, so, so if you know the cyber gluten solution of some theory, you can plot where all the sort of potential walls are. Um, so I, I thought you would give a formula in terms of that. Uh, no, well, these Z's, so, okay, so. So. Just a comment. In the simplest case of pure SQ2 cyber, we can get it actually as a physical interpretation. It's where the coefficient of the kinetic term of the W boson is close to zero. Right. In the, in the sort of electric description of the theory, right? When you come in from the outside. Yeah, yeah, I can use that. Um, I can believe that, but so let me describe it in terms of free potentials into it. So, 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 Z are determined by a free potential F. So, so. But in order to even write down the free potential, see, so far I've written down everything in a sort of totally duality invariant uh, way. Uh, now, it's true that the theory is locally described by a free potential. Um, so to give a free potential, I have to fix a uh, sort of splitting into electric and magnetic uh, charges. So, um, 
Right, if we fix the splitting of gamma into gamma electric plus gamma magnetic, so the Lagrangian can split. Um, uh, then you can you can write local coordinates. You can write local coordinates on P where the central charges of the electric guys just are your coordinates, and the central charges of the magnetic guys are the derivative of three potentials with respect to coordinates. Um, so then having done that, then you can re then you can rewrite this kind of condition in terms of the uh, in terms of the three potentials. Um, so it's basically a combination of A and A. That's right, that's right, exactly right. So this Z is just some these Z's are just linear combinations of A and B D. So for example, in the in the simple cyber wooden theory. Oh yeah, that, that's right, that's right, sorry. So so that's right. So, yeah, this is the simplest case where, uh, yeah, where there are no flavors. I may include the flavors. Include the flavors. Oh, you want me to put the flavors into the prepotential? In, into? Yeah, let's see. So, yes. Uh, okay, you're right. So, yeah, so this is just a simple case where there are no flavors. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so this is the simplest case where there are no flavors. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so this is just a simple case where there are no flavors. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so this is just a simple that's right. So now I want to ask you a question. In, in V prime, then I have this log up. So we have to be able to write that so That's right. Independently, whether it's a pure gauge theory, with a flavor, with all the other things. Uh, yeah, okay. So to do it with the flavors, it's probably, it's probably some trivial extension of what I just said here. But I haven't thought about it. It's just QEA plus QM, AD plus QM. No, that's. M. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, that's, um, and that's right. That's right. So I just write. So maybe you'll be happy with this. So I just write the uh, the formula for the free potential as q times a plus p times a tool plus there's a flavor charge that I call it saying m uh, n times the flavor mass, whatever it is. So that's just some parameter that you fix at the beginning. Um, and these are these are the, so this is z. Q, 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 q. Yeah. So again, the, the condition is that um, two of these two of these things. So so for each q and p and n, now this is some function on the on the prime. And the condition is that two of them should be linearly dependent over r. Um, that's that's where the wall. Okay. So 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 that's okay. So now I've described for you sort of the basic uh, uh, data that you get um, from an n equals two theory. And the infrared, uh, the infrared of an n equals two theory uh, plus the plus the BPS degeneracies. Uh, now I haven't told you, I haven't told you in some sense the most interesting part, which is um, the wall crossing, the wall crossing formula. Uh, it tells you how these integers jump um, when you cross a wall. And I'm not going to write it now, but we'll come back to it. Uh, uh, we'll come back to it in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, 
so with target is m, uh, some manifold m, uh, what does m look like? Well, m is just a torus vibration over v. And the picture is like this. OK, why is this the picture? So what are all the scalars that I have in three dimensions? Well, I just have, uh, first of all, I have all the scalars that I had in four dimensions. They just reduced to these scalars in three dimensions, and that's this b. Uh, and then on top of that, I have the stuff that came from the gauge fields. So if I uh, have a gauge field in four dimensions, I reduce it on the circle, uh, then it has a Wilson line. Um, so I get a scalar, a scalar in three dimensions, which is the Wilson line of that gauge field. Uh, and that's a circle value of the scalar. Um, uh, and then, the, the, and then I, there's also one more circle. Um, and that last circle, you could think of as either being the dualization of the gauge field in three dimensions, uh, or you can think of it as being, um, so to speak, the magnetic gauge field uh, from four dimensions. So, who's M? Right, so I'm just, I'm just describing M now. So, 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 so far I just said you have a, uh, you have a three-dimensional sigma model. So, whenever you have a three-dimensional sigma model, it's just a the theory of maps from the three-manifold into some M. Uh, and now I'm telling you what this M is. So, how come you have both electric and magnetic? Yeah, okay, so, um, so the answer depends on sort of whether you like uh, self-dual formalisms or not. Uh, maybe the, the safest way of describing it is just to say that um, uh, if you work in, in, in some definite formalism where you have, say, electric, uh, electric gauge fields, uh, then, in the, then in the dimensional reduction, let's say there's just one gauge field. So what do you get? So you get one scalar, which is the holonomy of the, uh, uh, the holonomy of the gauge field. And then you still have the gauge field left over, uh, the gauge field in three dimensions, right? So then you also have to dualize um, dualize the gauge field from three dimensions, and that gives you a second periodic scale. So however you count it, you get two periodic scalars. For each. Equal to the length of the gauge field. Right, two periodic scalars for each uh, for each U1 that you had in four dimensions. Yeah. So you integrate all the the flags or just set the throw uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not throwing it away. So um, so in a minute I'm gonna tell you the exact uh, the exact Lagrangian. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw away the well, yeah, that's right. Sorry, that's right. We integrate. We integrate them out. So here you only see the. Uh, so you have to correct. The so you have to correct the that's right. That's right. So I didn't tell you yet what the metric is. Um, I mean, the whole is a function of R. Yeah. That's right. But that's you right. correct the metric, but and, and one more. Question. Yeah. This will be effective. So. Uh, yeah. This is going to be the. This is going to be plus, the infrared. Plus. 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 So the effective of one. It's going to be the infrared. It's going to be the exact infrared theory. Plus seven pi. Well, are you going to quantize it or it will be classic? We're just going to talk about what is Lagrangian. Is. So we're going to talk, if you like, about the classic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so let me say it a little more systematically. So, so, so let's write in the dimension. So, um, so let's say the complex dimension of B, the complex dimension of B was R, which is the rank of the rank of the Um, and then the dimension, I tend to think about this uh, M in terms of its real dimension. So the real dimension of M is four times R. So uh, the Coulomb branch has real dimension 2R, um, and complex dimension R, so real dimension 2R. Uh, and then here, you have the torus of electric magnetic. Uh, both some lines. Uh, and this also has real dimension 2R. Um, yeah, that's right, that's right. So in fact, so we can describe it even a little uh, uh, a little more precisely. Um, uh, yeah, so first of all, um, uh, the structure that I'm, the structure that I'm telling you is the structure over is the structure over B prime. So I just described it by dimensional reduction of the abelian gauge theory, which is valid at some generic point of, uh, of B prime. Uh, yeah, let me tell you uh, exactly what this torus vibration is as a C infinity manifold. Uh, what it is is just you take this you take this lattice of electromagnetic charges that you started with um, and you tensor it uh, with the circle. Let's say R mod Z. Uh, 
uh, the dual the, the dual ways. Um, okay. Yes. So yeah, if I'm being if I'm being a little more careful as I should, um, I'm really describing uh, the part of it away from the singular. So this is the fiber. Uh, yeah. So this is the fiber. So the fiber is just some uh, two R torus. Um, ah, no more mistake. This is the angle. This is the angle. That's what they make the difference. And the fiber is the same torus which you just want to do. Exactly. Exactly. It's just the, the, the torus of characters of uh, gamma, gamma chain. Um, that's right. You said the main story is not the same. It's compactification. Compactification. Compacti did I say the main story? Yes, sir. I, I said the word. Yeah. Compactification. That's right. OK, so, um, so this is what, uh, so this is uh, what the what the dimensional reduction uh, looks like, at least, uh, at least topologically. <laughs> um, and now I want to say, uh, now I want to describe it in a little more detail. Oh, I said the dimensional the compactification. This is what the This is what this is No, but now I want to tell you the metric. So, so. Simpler name, shorter name. Um, okay, so so uh, so because the theory had n equals two supersymmetry in four dimensions, so n equals four after you uh, after you compactify it on the circle, um, it has n equals four supersymmetry in three dimensions. The reason equal supercharges. Um, uh, that implies that um, the metric, um, the metric on the target space, is actually hypercode. Well, yes, and also computable, but that doesn't follow from. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, well. No, no, on M prime is computable easily. On M is not. Yeah, that's right. On M prime, with some work, we're able to. Uh, before you put in the point of correction, it's easy. He said little contact. No, no, he's integrating out. Before you integrate out. Right, so I'm going to describe the exact oh, Lagrange, the exact low energy of Lagrange. So that involves integrating out all the uh, massive degrees. So this end right is before integrating. You mean, no, no, it's no, after. No, no. I'm going to give you the I'm, I'm going to give you the exact effect of the of the three dimensional theory. So that involves integrating out everything that's mass. All the colors of prime mode something. All colors of prime mode something. Both M okay, both M and M prime are good. So M prime is M is non singular. M in in the simplest cases, M is non singular. Um, yeah, let me just say that. So so. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's it's not immediately obvious. Yeah, so so from what I said so far, I just described for you what this torus vibration looks like away from the the singular divisor. I didn't try to tell you what it looks like on the singular divisor. Now, um, of course, you know physically that somehow um, uh, there's some physics of the theory also over the singular divisor. Um, and what's um, what's what's remarkable um, is that the three dimensional physics is actually, um, at least in the simplest cases. Uh, is actually smooth even when you go to this uh, singular device. So this hypercolor manifold M prime that I'm going to describe can actually be extended by putting in some singular torus fibers and actually be extended to a hypercolor metric even over the uh, on a on a on a singular on a, on a vibration uh, over the whole. But for now, I'm just telling you the metric. Uh, I'm just telling you the hypercolor metric away from this. What's the physical reason that the single circle is already sufficient as an infrared cutoff from positive degree? So in fact, it's uh, well. Okay, one thing I can tell you very easily. Um, one thing I can tell you very easily is why should the singularities, if they were present, be in higher co-dimension uh, than two? So the point is, why was there why was there a singularity at all here? The reason why there was a singularity was because some mode was becoming massive. Uh, some charged field uh, was becoming massless there, right? Now, when you reduce to when you reduce to three dimensions, um, you have these extra you have these extra gauge fields, right? Um, so sorry. When, you, when you reduce the three dimensions, you have these extra Wilson lines. Um, and so now, suppose you take your four-dimensional field and you expand it and close the Klein modes. 
right? The only mode that could possibly um, become uh, the only mode that could possibly become massless that could potentially become massless is the zero mode in that reduction, right? Um, but this, but there is no zero mode for generic value of the uh, of the Wilson line, right? Because the the mass of the thing has a contribution from the coupling to the to the Wilson line. Um, so that tells you that the singularities of, in the three dimensional theory, if they exist at all, they're only going to exist in a higher co-dimension because not only do you have to tune the Coulomb branch of the parameter, you also have to tune this uh, Wilson line. Co-dimension four. Yeah. So so. Right, so the story seems to be that you get singularities in co-dimension four rather than co-dimension two. But even something stronger is true. Um, in, for, if you study the very simplest, uh, uh, the very simplest kind of singularity, where just a single charge one hypermultiple that becomes massless, um, then, it, then you might have expected that that creates a singularity in co-dimension four. But as it turns out, the singularity is completely smooth in that case. And I'm not sure that, at least I don't know, like a really good effective field theory reason why the theory is still smooth even when. Uh, uh, even when this charge particles are becoming <coughs> Yeah, so at our zero to points, um, we don't have a complete understanding um, of what the behavior of the hypercalar metric looks like uh, when you go, when you look at the fiber over the R series at this point. Maybe if there is a Higgs branch there, there would be singularity in the Coulomb branch. If there is no Higgs branch, probably not. No singularity. That seems, that seems reasonable. But and this question is the branch. This this vibration is Lagrangian for um, this vibration is Lagrangian for a circle's worth of uh, complex symmetric structure. So so okay. So I'll come to the hypercalar. Uh -huh. That's right. It's not. It, 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 it's in one. I think it's a complex one. Okay. It's 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 Lagrangian in. So there's a CP, there's a CP one worth of there's a CP one worth of complex structures. I'm saying it's Lagrangian with respect to uh, the, all the complex structures that sit on the equator of that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so let me try to describe uh, uh, what the hypercalar metric actually is. Um, so. Just my end prime. I will try to, try to describe it. Um, the idea is that if you want to describe uh, if you want to describe a hypercalar metric, um, because of the twister, because of the twister construction, um, it's really sufficient to understand uh, what M prime looks like uh, uh, as a complex symplectic manifold in all of its complex structures at once. So, um, so M prime. One worth of complex and like structures so let's write them as a zeta omega zeta um, and what we want to do is to describe uh, um, to describe what the, what these complex and like structures are uh, so, so uh, zeta is the parameter in CP1. Uh, J zeta is just the complex structure, um, and omega zeta is the whole market um, And the way we describe them, so J zeta is not uh, J zeta. Well, actually, uh, omega is J zeta is not. If you're using the standard one, that's right. That's right. Um, it's, J zeta itself as a tensor is not doesn't depend holomorphically on zeta, um, but it'll be important that you can give J zeta holomorphic functions which are, do depend holomorphically on zeta. Um, okay, right, we'll see if we go along. So, um, so we want to describe it uh, by giving. What we're going to do is we're actually going to give um, explicit holomorphic Darboux coordinates. For omega, they'll be homomorphic with respect to this J, uh, and they'll be uh, and they'll be Darboux coordinates for this. And the, the big difference is J is actually complex structure on the whole twister space, not just on. Um, that's right. So so here, when I write it like this, I'm just describing the complex structure on, on each individual finding. Um, but it will be a fact that in fact B 
these holomorphic are good coordinates, will also depend holomorphically on zeta. And so they're really holomorphic functions on the twister space. I'm hiding the twister space slightly in the background of this story, but, but that's right. You could say that I'm giving holomorphic functions on the twister space. Um, Is there any uh, uh, complex technical system associated to the zeta? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, so the complex integrable system, yeah, so this, this, this hyperkeller manifold that I'm going to describe, if you look at it in its complex structure, uh, zeta equals to zero, uh, then the, 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 these torus fibers, um, these torus fibers will be really compact, complex tori, um, and so you have a family of compact, uh, complex tori uh, over, uh, over the base here, uh, equipped with a complex symplectic structure, uh, and that's your, that's your complex integrable system. Oh, the, the, yeah, the Hamiltonians are basically the, the, the Z in that case. Yeah. Any functions of the uh, is that good? There's a gamma C particular. It does not have a name. It, it, in some cases, it has a name. So in some cases, it's the Hitchin system. Um, I probably won't. Uh, so it's not always Hitchin. Um, if you just start with a random uh, n equals 2 theory, you don't know where you got it, then there's no reason to identify this with the Hitchin system. Uh, of course, in advanced collection of examples, it always comes out to be a efficient system. Um, so, so the story of the zero function. That, that's right, that's right. So these are, I mean, these are these are compact tori, which happen to be complex submanifolds if you pick uh, the complex structure at z equals to zero. And if you pick some other complex structure, uh, then these tori are not complex submanifolds. So actually, you said symplectic structure so make later, so zero is not the same later. Um, yeah, when, when, that's right, that's right. So he asked me, he asked the question, when are these tori Lagrangian? And the answer is they're Lagrangian when the complex structure is on the equator. Yes. Now, if you ask when are they complex submanifolds, they're complex submanifolds when at z equals zero. Or when it's the Lagrangian. Yeah, it's, they're, they're Lagrangian with respect to, um, in complex structures, they're all zero. Yeah, yeah, Lagrangian with respect to the omega 3. No, but they're Lagrangian with respect to the Kähler form. But um, not with respect to the complex. Not with respect to the whole complex. So, so it's not a complex. I get that. It's not a complex. It's not a complex. It is a complex. But zeta no. equals zero. Zeta equals zero is Lagrangian with respect to omega i, right? Yes. Right. They're Lagrangian with respect to the Kähler form. That is what makes oh, it a system. The story of Lagrangian with respect to capital omega i. Uh, that's right. No, no. Uh, that's what makes it a complex. No. Oh yeah, I said it backwards. Actually, that's right. That's right. He said that it's not a complex integral system because it's uh, symplectic for one and a complex structure and the Lagrangian for the other. I don't know if it's the same. So, no, no, but it is complex. It, it is a complex integral system. It is a complex integral system. Yes. So, so, in the same complex structure. Sure well, until now, until the time variables were introduced, I thought that this was complete parallel to the Sorry, but you can't be parallel. It's here work with complex structures. So when you go back to four dimensions, there is a distinguished complex structure, which you look at this complex structure, which is the z equal to zero. And this complex structure is so there is also a homomorphic symplectic form, which has type two zero in this complex structure. This is what we usually call capital omega i. So in this connect, so this is a homomorphic symplectic form and the story is a large and They also homomorphic in the complex structure r. That makes it yeah, that's exactly right. Sorry, I said it. I said it backwards. So, um, that's right. That's right. So, so, that's right. Uh, that's right. 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 That's just to connect that with what I said earlier, that they're Lagrangian with respect to the circle of the You can take real part of that, right? by by any face. Right. So these are the Kähler forms in complex structures J and K. So in any in the complex structure J or the complex structure K or any linear combination thereof, it's Lagrangian with respect to the uh, the, the symplectic form, the, the Kähler form. 
And that's what I usually mean when I say the render, which is why I got this. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. Uh, okay, very good. So now, so, um, so now I want to describe uh, uh, what these homomorphic coordinates look like. Um, so, so what we give is we give a coordinate uh, that we call y gamma. Um, so we give it, if you like, locally, locally over the base. So whenever you have a local uh, section gamma, you give a corresponding coordinate y gamma. Um, this is what we used to call it. Uh, yeah, we used to call them uh, x gamma, now we're calling them uh, y gamma. Um, uh, so and they're characterized uh, by obeying um, a sort of interesting integral equation. Um, so the integral equation is, so first, there's sort of a simple um, explicit part. So, so there's the simple explicit part, and then there's a there's a correction, instant time correction. Which I'll just write on the next line. So one more thing I should say about that. So the way I just described it, the way I just described it makes it sound as if 
this description is going to work best um, around large uh, around large radius. Uh, and that's and that's indeed the case. So so these corrections, um, the corrections that come from this integral, uh, this complicated part of the, of the formula, um, these corrections are suppressed. They're suppressed like e to the minus r. That's what you expect from this picture. They're suppressed like e to the minus r times the, uh, um, the central charge of the BPS particle that's contributing. Um, so, so I do not think that the something which is not in the muscle sector in coordination is contributing to the muscle sector of the method. Sure, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, that's that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, I mean, in cyber width, also. No, no, but the prepotential itself. Well, the formation of potential can be obtained by similar. This is a similar thing. Right, right. That's like the reward model. What's that? What's that? What's that? Um, 
Now, the real truth of the matter, as we understand it, um, is that there's a little, uh, uh, M is not quite this. M is a little twisting of this, so it, which is, you can define it sort of tautologically to be the thing which has coordinate functions obeying not this relation, but this relation, theta gamma plus gamma prime plus, pi times gamma prime gamma with gamma prime. Um, and if I put this twisting into my, into my definition of M, let me not try to say why I should put this twisting into my definition of M. This is a mathematical statement. If I do that, um, then of course, because I have I theta gamma occurring here, then these y gammas are going to obey the um, this relation is a little twist. But I really don't want to say even another word about it, but it's uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. So the question is how how should I really define it so that so that it'll have this uh, twisted coordinate? Yeah. I could take this. Okay, I could, I could take this and twist it by system. Um, so I could take yeah, I could take gamma cool um, times the set of all quadratic refinements of. You take the torsor of quadratic refinements and then divide by equivalents. That's right. That's right. I could take it. So if I let uh, if I let's say um, f uh, f be the torsor of all quadratic refinements of this uh, pairing, um, then I could take uh, gamma tools times f modulo of equivalence relation that says so what's a what's a what's a quadratic refinement? Quadratic refinement is a sigma. So all sigmas um, from gamma to the g2, such so the sigma of gamma, sigma of gamma prime, is minus to the gamma gamma prime, sigma of gamma plus gamma prime. So let me call that f, the set of all these quadratic refinements. Um, and then I could take my, uh, um, I could take, instead of taking gamma dual, I could take gamma dual cross with the set of all quadratic refinements. Uh, modulo the, um, right, no, I actually want to have this outside. So, gamma dual tensor R minus 2 pi Z, the whole thing times the set of all quadratic refinements. Uh, and then I could mod out by an equivalence um, that says that, so if I've got two quadratic refinements, so point of the force I call theta, a quadratic refinement I call sigma, um, uh, so, if I change the quadratic refinement from sigma to sigma prime, I have to make a shift of the uh, torus angles here. Uh, and the shift is that theta, theta gamma gets shifted by pi times something that I call c of sigma sigma prime, c gamma of sigma sigma prime. And what this c gamma is, uh, it's just the fact that any two quadratic refinements, sigma and sigma prime, just differ by some linear. Uh, uh, by some linear uh, map from um, from gamma to C two, and I just I just make the corresponding shift with the uh, angles. So it's just I mean it's just a canonical way of making that thing move. This definition was just the original definition was just engineered to produce functions that obey this uh, relation, um, and you can similarly engineer something that uh, canonically has functions that obey that. Relation. That's all. That's all. Sorry, what was the question? Well, eventually you are counting something in four dimensions, not on other three times, just one. Well, four. okay. I saw, I saw, wait, wait. I, I just hear your talk from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You wanted to learn something about the generation of the field space on our Yeah, that was our original, that was our original motivation. And, and indeed, for that, we mostly care about the sort of, the behavior of this construction here, or that's exactly right. And the omega is, that's the generation on our only because that degeneracy yeah, depends on R or something like that. Um, no, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's only because it's absolutely independent of uh, independent R. Do you want a formula for that? It's not that we want a formula for omega. It, this is a little more backward than that. So, so what we're interested in is understanding um, the wall crossing behavior of omega. So the goal of this part of the talk is not to construct a formula for omega, um, but rather is to do a very indirect thing. So, so if you accept this formula for y gamma. So here I gave you some complicated formula for y gamma in terms of omegas. Um, I didn't tell you where it comes from, but suppose you accept this formula for a minute. Um, then, what's that? Yeah, yeah, 
That's right. I, I told you that it comes from studying the instant configuration. So, so is, it, is it the way you actually divide it, or is just you, you just you know feed the integral kernel to, to reproduce the process? Uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. The one person formula is not put into this. Um, the wall crossing formula is derived. Right. Um, <laughs> well, there was a reason why I wanted to ask you. Because you could have done T2 for, I mean, for even S1. You could have done go to the two dimensions of T2, lots of other things. That's right. That's right. Eventually, you would get lots of other answers in two dimensions and so on. You are interested in wall crossings of omega, we wish you a similar result. And that's right. That, so that, that's exactly the way we consider It's an indirect way of computing wall crossings of omega if you know something good about three dimensional Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And the good thing that you know, the good thing that you know is that the three dimensional theory um, should have, the hyperkalonic metric should be just smooth. Um, in particular, when you cross a wall. That's because gauge fields are dual discoveries. That's because gauge fields are dual discoveries, so you just have a sigma model, and in that sigma model, you don't expect any phase transition. So, so yeah. And this 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 three dimensional theory is not quantization of UV theory dimensional reduced to three dimensions. It is not the same. It's the, it's, it's the effective low energy theory of of, of, of the DH theory of the theory. Yeah, it's one dimensional. No, you so take you take your SU choose a little bit and put it on a three tensor one, and there is a low energy of the Lagrange. Yeah. That's it. So it's one dimensional set. Yeah. It doesn't do with three dimensions. No, it's on a three times S1. Yeah, you put it on R3 times S1, and then you take the, the very low energy limit. And that limit, it looks three dimensional, and you're writing the effective Lagrangian that. Yeah, what well, I meant is it's not a dimensional theory, it's three dimensions and quantize the three dimensional theory. No, no, we're never quantizing against three dimensional yeah. theory. No, no. UV theory. There is a UV three dimensional theory. is four dimensional. This theory is this theory is four dimensional in UV. That's right. We just said it's a four dimensional theory in UV. We put it on R3 times the circle. It's defined on R3 times the circle. But you can have all the diseases of all dimensional cells. <laughs> yeah, if the theory, if theory didn't exist on R3 times the circle, that would be a problem for us. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I think that's for, right. For, even for the Fourier theory, you don't have this continuity in one. That's right, that's right. So I'm not sure what diseases, what diseases yeah. you can look at. I thought we were using some properties of three dimensional cells, not having certain, certain problems with. Uh, Right. No, no, but they, we're talking about the, the okay, the, the question is whether it has the question is whether the theory has a phase transition or not. Even the four-dimensional theory didn't have a phase transition. So you don't expect that it's gonna develop a phase transition when it's put on R3 times the circle. That's all I'm saying. Right? The, the 40 theory, something happened at the walls, but that was something that was some transition in the BPS spectrum. It's not a phase transition. So when you put the theory on R3 times the circle, it still shouldn't have a phase transition. And that's all that's all we're trying to do. Um, okay, so so just uh, um, yeah. Let, let me let me uh, let me avoid the, the questions about this query. Um, okay. Okay. So so uh, so. Um, I think since, since Greg is going to need it for his talk, let me just say a, a couple more words about uh, the properties of these y -gamers. So, um, uh, so if we call this equation, right? if I call this equation star, um, y gamma given by star, uh, well, if you look at this function, um, uh, ah, sorry, I've forgotten uh, to write one more, one other important thing. Here, so so far you just wrote some crazy system of equations which we don't know how to solve and we don't know whether the solution is the um, right. I just told you. So uh, I didn't tell you why, but I told you that uh, that turns out to be the. Uh, um, oh, no, we do know how to solve them at one time. We know how to solve them sort of iteratively. We don't know how to write an exact the, solution. The, 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 the iteration of this integral equation converges beautifully. Yes. Um, what did you tell what? us what the like, contour was? Yeah, that's right. So I'm just going to tell you the contour. So, 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 the, so the contour, um, so for each gamma prime here, we're doing some integral over a contour. Uh, and the contour, so this is a contour in the zeta plane. Um, and it's just the set of uh, all zeta prime such that 
uh, zeta prime over uh, z gamma prime is real and negative. Um, so the picture is like this. Um, uh, for some fixed value, for some fixed value of u, uh, so these z of gamma primes are just some fixed numbers. Uh, the picture is like this. So here's the zeta prime plane, um, and we have these various contours, various rays, which we call, what we call BPS rays, uh, corresponding to the various different gamma prime. Uh, so we call this L gamma prime. Well, this is L gamma one. Okay, three and so on. Um, not for every gamma, but only for those for only for those gamma primes um, for which this omega is non-zero. Those are the only ones for which uh, have an actual uh, integral here. Um, so basically, to each BPS to each BPS state of the four-dimensional theory, to each BPS state, we're attaching one of these rays. And these rays are determined by A and B that we discussed. Exactly, exactly. They're determined they're determined by the central charges, which are just A and B. Right. So as you move around in the Coulomb branch, these rays are moving. Are moving around, um, and now this this the y gamma, y gamma that's given by this integral equation, um, you can see that it's it's uh, um, it's going to have discontinuities. It's going to have discontinuities exactly along these rays because uh, along these rays, this integral has a problem that uh, you run into a you run into a hole. Um, so y gamma given by star is actually discontinuous. Uh, when, zeta, uh, when zeta gets the rays, the BPS rays. So why gamma is not a smooth function? Exactly. Sorry, not a smooth function of what? Yeah. No, this, gamma, is, gamma is just this discrete chart, but it's not a smooth function of zeta. Zeta, zeta the, the twister part. Exactly. Exactly. It's not a smooth function of zeta. Is it because only the jumps? Ah, now be careful. Now, this so far, what I just said, doesn't have to do with omega jumping. So um, why, why is this continuous? Yeah, the, the discontinuity is just because um, uh, uh, it's just because this integral kernel becomes uh, has a pole at that level. Because for any kernel, you can put any L down prime because when they are against the point, so it doesn't explain the choice of this contour. Um, for contour. Yes, yes. any contour would be there going to say. But that's right. But I made a definite choice of I made a definite choice of the contour. Right. Right. Having made that definite choice, I'll have discontinuities at these definite rates. Right. That's all. That's right. That definite um, choice is computed from some other things that we yeah. have learned. Yeah. Why this definite choice? What is the origin? Well, okay, okay, okay. okay. So, so in fact, there is a little bit of there is a little bit of flexibility in this story, right? Uh, I could have I could have pushed the contour around a little bit, but there's a limit to how much you can do that. If you push the contour too far, um, uh, the convergence of this uh, the convergence of these integrals becomes um, So the point is that uh, choosing the contour the way I did, um, this factor, this log of uh, one minus y gamma, um, becomes exponentially small at the two uh, ends of the contour. From infinity to zero, okay. that's right. Uh, each contour is from infinity to zero. is defined by this equation. Yeah. Okay, so so good. So I'm claiming something about the nature of the solution of this uh, integral equation. So look, for example, just to get just to get oriented, um, just look at the behavior of the uh, first approximation to the solution. Uh, that that captures everything I'm saying here. So the first approximation to the solution. Uh, at lar a very large or small zeta is just dominated by uh, is just dominated by this piece, right? So depending on what the phase of zeta is, um, it'll either become exponentially large or exponentially small. And the contour I'm choosing here is the contour which maximizes the exponential decrease. Now I, you can see from that that I could have deformed it a little bit, but sort of at the cost of uh, uh, making my life in this integral equation a little more difficult. This is somehow the best choice. And uh, well, as we'll see, in fact, in in, uh, in Greg's talk, there's some physics behind. There is ultimately some physics behind this choice. At the level of the integral equation, we see that this doesn't appear. Um, okay. Um, so all I wanted to say about this, is, we should say that, I mean, that this, you know, this came out of a one-loop calculation. Okay, good. So, but the choice of contour really didn't. I mean, yeah. we could have we could have changed the contour in that one loop. That's in that part of this. The thing. answer. So, uh, the it doesn't depend on the contour. The answer came out of one. So hypercalorimetric doesn't depend on the contour, but strictly speaking, these y gammas do. So. I, 
So is this something to do with the regularization of that one of computation? It's not something to do with the regular. The thing is that the, the one of computation, okay, the one of computation that Greg's referring to um, is the calculation of uh, um, the exact hyperkähler metric in the case of um, just the U1 theory with one massive hyperkähler. Uh, now, in that theory, um, already uh, Oguri and Bapa and also Sagari and Schenker told us exactly what the hyperkähler metric should be. Um, and the, that's right. So we so we found a way of rewriting that exact hyperkähler metric in this form. Um, in that case, that's basically the only non-trivial example, more or less, where you can solve this integral equation exactly. Um, and so we gave these functions uh, y gamma in that case. Um, so that's and that, that's an important ingredient in the derivation in the general case. Is the statement that when you go near uh, uh, when you go near any singular point uh, where just one guy contributes, you know what answer you're supposed to get is the answer. And, and they had the correct answer. Yeah. And how do you know that many particles they all contribute to this potential? Yeah, so there's a more there's a more delicate argument uh, that tries to explain that. So um, basically, what you do is um, for, first first you argue that you can go to arbitrarily large R to answer this question. So suppose for a second that you can go to arbitrarily large R. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, I'm oh jeez. Um, okay. Yeah, let me try to do the rest of the thing that Greg already heard. Is five days. What's that? Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, Greg, Greg has much more to cover, so I don't want to saddle him with having, uh, not having the free word. So the first thing I want to say is that this y gamma has a very specific discontinuity. Um, you can work out exactly what the discontinuity is just by calculating the residue, uh, the residue of this pole. Um, and what it is, is so when you cross the BPS frame by L gamma prime, the discontinuity that you get is Y gamma prime goes to Y gamma times 1 minus Y gamma prime to the power gamma times gamma prime. So we have this collection of functions Y gamma prime um, <coughs> defined, if you like, in each little sector. Um, uh, and whenever you, whenever, you cross, um, whenever you cross one of these BPS rays, um, the functions y gamma just transformed in this very specific uh, simple way. Um, uh, okay, okay. So what happens? So what happens in omega? So. And the, the omega. Oh, omega. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Omega. This is three more. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah. So. So. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, so you have a minus. Yeah, uh, that's right. I wrote, I wrote minus. Um, um, so, uh, so, 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 okay, so now, um, so here I'm writing, uh, here I'm writing the, the discontinuities, and I sort of thought of it as you sit, sit at some fixed value of u, uh, and you move in the and you move in the zeta plane, and you see this discount, these discontinuities. Um, now, and these discontinuities, by the way, um, uh, don't affect uh, the holomorphic symplectic form. So you might say, well, this is nonsense because these are supposed to be the dark blue coordinates, the holomorphic dark blue coordinates, and they're not even continuous. How can that define a continuous hypercolor metric? Okay. <laughs> right. So it works because this is this is a symplectic morphism. Um, now, on the other hand, it is important that these are the only discontinuities that the, that the functions have. The only discontinuities arise from symplectic morphisms. Um, and that gives a sort of uh, um, that gives a sort of consistency condition because you can now manage doing the following thing. So let's have here uh, the coordinate zeta, um, and here I'll draw one direction in the U plane. Um, so here is some initial point, data comma u. Um, and now let's imagine going from zeta comma u to zeta prime uh, comma u prime um, along two different paths. So here in the vacuum labeled by u, um, let's say I have two relevant DPS states. 
with some definite phases. So they give me DPS rays there at, let's say, these, these particular values of data. Um, so the Y gammas, in traveling from here to here, undergo um, two of these uh, transformations. Uh, and now, um, let's look at this vacuum over in this vacuum over here. As we know, there's this wall crossing phenomenon. So the, the spectrum of DPS states here may be different. Um, and suppose that here, the simplest thing you can imagine is that here there are there are, say, three BPS states. So here I have some other product of uh, coordinate transformations. Um, now, so if I try to fill in the picture of how these BPS rays are, are moving as a function of U, what's happening, of course, is that they hit each other. When they hit each other, this is the moment when the wall crossing can occur. And so on the other side of the wall, there are three BPS states. So the picture looks like this. But now, we can consider these two different paths. So, has in the joint zeta u space. One that goes like this, and one that goes like this. Well, the, the coordinate transformations that I got, the composition of coordinate transformations has to be the same one on the two sides. Because these functions have no other discontinuities than the ones that uh, you encounter here. Um, and so that's what leads to this wall crossing formula. So it tells you that the product of these two symplectic morphisms has to be equal to the product of these three symplectic morphisms. You could use that to determine, if you hadn't known the BPS spectrum here, you could have determined it just by knowing the spectrum here, just by knowing the symplectic morphism that's attached to this line. You could figure out this is, is the same symplectic morphism here, and that determines this spectrum. So that's formula the formula for y has the same spectrum. That's right. So the formula for y that I wrote sort of implicitly contained a condition on the omegas, because other, if the omegas don't obey this consistency relation, then y would not be continuous. Um, the problem is that the interval. For example, infinite. Sorry? For example, you don't see omegas. Yeah, if r is strictly infinite, then you don't see the corrections at all. Um, but this one. Okay, but, but, but no, let me say something better. Greg in his talk is going to describe it, a, a sort of variant of this argument, which works directly in four dimensions. It doesn't use this. So, yeah, so just wait for this talk. Um, okay, just the last thing I want to say uh, very, very briefly is that. Um, so. Uh, so there's a class of annual two theories. Uh, you get from reducing the two zero theory this 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 sort of magical uh, two comma zero super super conformal field theory in six dimensions. Um, you can get a big class of n equals 2 theories by taking that six dimensional theory um, and reducing it on a curve. Uh, in general, with some punctures, with some defect operators inserted at points on the curve. Um, uh, so then all of our data uh, becomes sort of geometric. They can, they can be, all the data can be described just geometrically uh, described in, in terms of C. Um, and let me just tell you what the data are. Uh, I don't think I have time. I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's actually a major result. There is a formula for omega gamma for the A1 theories. Uh, was absolutely. That, was that the, the key to Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I thought, sorry, I thought you meant the geometric picture. Of the That's right, there is actually a formula. Uh, just for the A1 theory. Right. There's a definition of a gamma formula. If, if, if you take A1 in six dimensions, then we have a definite algorithm you can put on the computer to calculate the omega of gamma. No wall so, crossing. Uh, there is an answer I could write in one minute. Uh, um, <laughs> So, so what is the data? So, um, uh, B. In fact, let me just do. Let me just do A one here. Um, so let's specialize. Some of what I'm about to say is actually more general, but let's specialize to, um, to the two times zero A one theory. Um, 
then P is just the space of uh, um, holomorphic, uh, meromorphic, in general meromorphic, uh, quadratic differentials. on C um, with specified poles at the punctures. So in the simplest case, you literally just fix some residues at finite and many points, and B is just the space of all quadratic differentials with those residues at this finite and many points. Um, so gamma, the charge lattice, is just the homology, oh, it's just a spectrum. Um, so, for any, uh, so for any quadratic differential, this associated uh, double cover um, of the spectral curve. So, yeah, so u corresponds to some quadratic differential, call it phi two, um, and then that that, quad, that quadratic differential, just by taking the two square roots of that quadratic differential, you get a double cover of. Uh, uh, the whole cover of C, living inside the cotangent bundle of C. Um, so then I can define, so the lattice, this lattice of charges, which is the first homology of the spectral curve, more exactly, is the part of that homology that's odd under the evolution exchanging the, the two sheets. Um, the periods. The essential charges or periods um, are just so normalization um, are just the integral. So any gamma here is just some cycle on the spectral curve, um, and on the cotangent bundle, the C, of course, is this canonical Darboux one form. That's called Lieber. Oh, Lieber. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's Darboux. Sorry. Yeah. That's right, the legal one. Um, uh, and then, um, so omega, well, let's say, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. let's just say omega is counting certain curves on C without saying exactly what they are. Um, uh, and then this modulized space M, um, modulized space M is just the modulized space of P bundle. Of SL2 in this case. Well, let's say SU2 B bundles. Is there a curse in geodesics in the metric more than square of square lambda? Um, they're actually even more constrained than that. So, so, um, string junctions. Uh, okay, in general, you would have string junctions, but for the two zero, for the A one theory, you don't have any string junctions. You just have uh, string junctions. Um, yeah, what they are? They, okay, they obey the equation. I guess that's what they are. So, um, so. Uh, they obey the equation that so you have this um, um, you have this uh, form we have this we have this quadratic differential of phi two right um, so let's look at now considered on C uh, let's take a square root of phi two it's only defined up to a sign but the sign won't affect the equation that we have to write um, so so you have this one form uh, defined up to sign uh, and now let's look at um, e to the i theta times that one form for some arbitrary phase uh, theta um, and require that that should be real. Uh, so another way of saying it is that you introduce the coordinate, you introduce the local coordinate, uh, uh, which also appeared yesterday, uh, uh, w to be just the integral of the square root of phi 2, and then you will get straight lines in the w plane with some any, any arbitrary angle. Um, so you have, you look at curves like that, um, you look for curves which either so these curves can begin and end on the zeros of phi two. So that's one kind of PPS state. And the other kind of PPS state is to have a yeah, to have a closed curve. So these are double both the first ones that have one Exactly. So these these guys are contribute only equals one, and these guys contribute only equals minus two. 
Um, that's right. In this picture, um, this picture, uh, of course, uh, isn't due to us. This picture has been, uh, has been around for a while. Yeah, Lerke, Warner, Meyer, Rocco, I think. Yeah. Um, that's right. That's right. So th that's what these old are. And, and what we're saying is that if you take these data, uh, just these data, and plug them into our construction, um, then the hyperkiller uh, manifold that you get um, is a, is a, is a modular space of um, SU2 Higgs bundles on C. Now, to, uh, this is a statement that we really know how to, we really know how to prove it and see these YDMs explicitly um, for the A1 theory with punctures. It's important that you take, that you take some punctures. The whole story becomes much simpler. Um, and then we can really see everything very explicitly using, in that case, these Y gammas become essentially some coordinates that uh, Bach and Bachrow have used a lot um, on modulus case of the system. Okay, so sorry. I, 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>